topic. Thanks for joining us. So, I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to part two of Jade Regent in Mark's Adventures line. Here I'm going to talk about some more of my adjustments that I've made to the Jade Region Adventure Path and with commentary from Linda who played in the Jade Region Adventure Path and if you saw her interview said that that had one of her favorite characters that she's ever played. Mm -hmm. So if you're joining us here on YouTube especially then that means you're not here in real time and you could definitely go back and watch part one. That's more about some of the game subsystems that I introduced. But it also introduces the names of certain characters I added that may come up in this episode where I'm going to talk about the plot, some adjustments that I made mechanically, additional insertions that I added into the story of the adventure. So, with that out of the way, I'm going to probably go mostly part 1 through part 6. But I want to talk about one of the trickiest plot elements or the thing that I didn't correct. The thing I couldn't correct because by the time I figured it out it was too late and I just asked everyone in the game to bear with me and ignore uh, but you might be able to correct and that is that there is a sort of a time warp temporal shift in this adventure path that is not intended but essentially a Mako's backstory of, oh, my family had so many generations and we were all going over the north, um, the crown of the world, and, and then all these things happened, pretty much demands that, like, 50 or more years have passed since the Jade Regent's overthrow, whereas everything else in the adventure path other than a Mako and her family and what happened with them really want the Jade Regent to have been in control for much, much shorter time than that. When you get to Minkai, you see a Minkai that is struggling under the Terranus rulership of the Jade Regent that has been for, there for years, but relatively recently um, interposed. Characters, ages of people who fought while that overthrow stuff was happening are not old enough, such as Hirabashi Jiro, the Jade Regent, himself and Ren Shiveda and a lot of the other characters they really want this to have not happened so it was far too late by the time I figured that out because you really only notice it in maybe part five or part six of the adventure path that this is a serious problem uh, or at least serious if you care about like exactly what year did things happen some players or groups just might not notice or care mm -hmm. if you do one way that you might be able to get around it could be to cut out one generation of Amatatsus. So you could say that the one who ran away was Ameko's father. I know that the adventures, including Rise of the Rune Lords, really make him out to be a terrible, horrible loser who really the only thing he ever did was not listen to his father as a child, get everyone killed, and be a bitter old man who killed his wife. So you would have to be adding elements to him that were slightly more positive, such as running away from an evil regime and uh, getting his, his stuff together enough to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure quite exactly if it would work completely because the ghost of the grandfather does show up in part one, and at that point there wouldn't be one, and may, or I guess you could say he that he had his at the time old father with him when they crossed over yeah, and that did. guy knew more stuff and then he was the ghost and it might still work out but you really need that um Amigo's father to have been doing the crossing and Amigo to probably have been born based on her age before she was like before they were even in sandpoint probably born even before they were in brine wall in order to get the timing to work out with the Minkai side of things. The other alternative is you can mess around with the Minkai side of things, but that requires adjusting way more of the plot and the feel of the country, and I feel like would adjust more of the adventure than just uh, changing around the backstory of the Amatatsu slash Kajutsu family. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a big thing that I didn't do, but that you can do. 
let's move into some of the things that I did do. So last week we talked about the uh, relationship system that has the milestone levels. And we also talked about the new caravan combat system. So I'm not going to go over them again in detail, but I will mention names of characters who are in the relationship system that um, the party picked up and sort of what was I was going on with them as we move along. So let's start with part one, the Brian Wall legacy. So in part one, basically at the beginning, it was pretty much as is for, um, for the adventure path. And everyone in the adventure had played Weeby Goblins, so they knew about the Licto tribe. And honestly, I think that the fight where you guys provoked like, the entire Licto tribe at the same time was like, maybe one of the tougher fights for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, path. the thing is, when you're when you're really low level, right, your things can be a little more swingy, and you haven't gotten the feel for how your team works together as much, so it was definitely one of those moments where it's like, oh gosh, is it all going to end here? And it was, it was somewhat close, but you guys did kind of take on and take out the Lito tribe, which mm -hmm. is at the beginning, and then we moved on to the ship, and based on some advice I had seen on the message boards, combined with the fact that we had one player, Kagi the Ninja, who was actually the grandson of the um, the bodyguard suit, um, or wait, uh, I don't remember what his name is right now. I was I think I was saying Sutamu, but that's actually a Mako's that's, uh, grandfather. Yeah. So the bodyguard guy who became a skeletal champion mm -hmm. in part one, his grandson was a PC. So I had that skeletal champion there, and instead of the encounters that were in the book, I used a, an online tip for the Jade Regent sub forums, and we did waves of skeletons uh, with the skeletal champion in the back, like watching as the group defeated each wave of champion and nodding, and then he came out at the end to fight them. Instead of every, all of them fighting together, which would have been too much for the party, just as like the typical, ah, yes, you must defeat these mm -hmm. skeletons. Is this was this perhaps one of the first um, the first sort of anime trope things that came up in the game? Because we definitely had a lot of moments where you could just imagine like an anime going on in the background. It's like, oh, you have not seen my true power. Oh, you must face your minions before you are worthy of facing me, and like super mega ultra attack and stuff like that. There are definitely some elements that might have been inspired by anime or by just sort of Eastern culture in general that were appended to this and yes that was just one that was from the, the the forums but certainly we had a jrpg style final battle um at the very very end um that we will get to completely at the opposite side of this episode yes. but um uh, and throughout but yes absolutely so there were the waves of skeletons and then the skeletal champion and kagi realized it was his grandfather and they found the they found the evidence just like in the normal adventure and decided to start the caravan. So at this point I wrote a few little um, adventures for the caravan, although I hear that or I know that Legendary Games put out a I think Road of Destiny or something expansion that was after I was done with that portion that filled in the gap of, oh wow, you traveled a huge amount of time. And you didn't really, there wasn't really much that happened. I definitely had people stop in at some of the different settlements that were along the way, like Galdoria with their sparkly Twilight um, Necromancy Academy, <laughs> um, and Wolf's Ear, and some of the other places that were on the way. It up wasn't towards technically, the this isn't technically not, sparkly it's called, the, it's called the Twilight Academy, and it has necromancy. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I, it's clearly sparkly. I, <laughs> I, I choose. I, I'm pretty sure that was not originally intentional, but it was kind of mandatory by the time we got there, wasn't it? I think it was. I just do. So. Um, <laughs> They eventually made it all the way up to Brimewall, and that was more or less only a few different additions. I didn't add a huge subplot, although I've heard Road of Destiny is good. Mm -hmm. But when we got to Brimewall is when I started making a few more changes to the adventure. One of the major changes that 
I made, which was actually also based on the message boards, just of other groups that was interested in the character, is that I didn't have Zyobi suicidally attack the party after she had already won against Gukonu at the end. Zyobi is a harpy, by the way. Zyobi is a mute cursed harpy uh, who is cursed by Pazuzu, and she has to touch people to telepathically communicate, but she is mute. And generally, what happens in the adventure is that she had a long-distance telepathic bond. She can have one up at a time with uh, Kikonu, her ex-lover, but then he used a sort of Mockingbird-style ability to steal her voice, even though she didn't have her voice, and she got really mad. If she can't have her voice, no one can, and decided he needs to die. So she contacts the PCs, and they get into a fight with him and she helps out and then after that she turns on the pcs and attacks them but seriously the point that they were at in the fight the pcs were fine and she was not fine mm -hmm. so there was no reason for her to do that and she just kept asking for um St oh, sorry. Statler says, pretty cool. Paizo designer developers can find good ideas in the message boards. Well, I want to stress that mm -hmm. at the time, I was just some guy who was writing the adventure path in Boston. In fact, Jade Regent was something that really straddled my uh, hiring at Paizo. I literally had Forest of Spirits like with me reading it waiting near customer service for them to call me to my interview at paizo when i came over to redmond to be interviewed and yeah i finished running it after uh, we worked at paizo remotely with our friends back in boston and our one friend who was larping jade region in real life and went to vietnam mm -hmm. partway through the adventure roughly around when everyone was going to tian cha yeah so, but you know we can't, that doesn't mean that we still can't find great ideas in the message boards. I mean, I know definitely for my Keymaker campaign. There I mean, were you a lot used of, some of the Dude Meister oh, yeah. uh, things in the your Dude Meister stuff, The Dude Meister stuff was super useful. Like, I, I use a lot of that as the, the starting point. And I'm trying to remember the, uh, the, the spreadsheets, too. Oh, yeah, you started with some spreadsheets that were on there. Were yeah, those, I started were with those. Were those Malwing spreadsheets or was that somebody oh, else's? Gosh. I know Malwing has spreadsheets. Now we're going back like eight but years. But your so spreadsheet exactly eventually yet. became like this thing it, that was yeah. just so complicated, but just did everything. Yeah, but that's not that's not the topic of this yes. episode. But yeah, Linda's Kingmaker could be another interesting topic. There were so many things she added. She added an entire region that was the size of one of the maps that other adventure parts. Not part one because it added a double sized map, but a like part three or four. She added that size of map that was between Galt and. Um, the Noman Heights, because she figured we might try to annex it. It didn't belong to any River Kingdom. So. You totally did. It was like, because you know how players are. They'll be like, oh, what's that place over there that's not detailed in the AP and that is giant and presumably full of stuff, so. The Lost Larn region. The Lost Larn region, yep. Right. But, yeah, we absolutely, um, and as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, I also even took the idea, because I was doing everything with the Harrow for a 54 Spirits in the Forest of Spirits that were based on the Harrow. Um, mm -hmm. Statler says, I hear a lot about the Kingmaker extra stuff since it is now on the crowdfunding campaign. Well, um, Linda's extra stuff is not necessarily on the crowdfunding campaign, but, I mean, I don't know what's going to actually be in Kingmaker in the end, and Linda is now at the company, so who mm -hmm. knows? Probably not the Lost Lion region, but um, some of the other things that she came up with might wind up being it in there. We'll see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very exciting. The crowdfunding campaign was ex extended for some additional time to go past the cons. Initially, it was going to stop before PaizoCon so that customer service didn't have to deal with it through PaizoCon, but they came up with a good way to handle it, and they feel like they could. So it's extended. Yay! Um, Jim says, isn't it though? Uh, I don't know what he's referring to. Can, can you well, tell? What was I saying um, when he said, isn't it though? Let's see. Well, it could be the, um, the Forest Kingdoms Compendium PDF oh, from Legendary Games. Jim says, Games. I thought Legendary Games compilation is there and Linda yeah. contributed to that. No, so, I, I did. So, the, that's so what if you buy the 5e Legendary Games Forest Compendium, then some of Linda's magic items 
I am that expansion, although converted to 5e. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is already possible to buy something on that Kickstarter that Linda wrote, even though at the time when we were running Kingmaker, obviously we were still fans back over mm -hmm. there in Boston. So absolutely, that's a good point. Um, so based on a lot of people saying that they teamed up with Ziobi, like surprisingly much, and there's even like fan art of Ziobi, she was for some reason kind of a favorite. Plus, there was no reason for her to fight. She demanded a double share of the treasure, and the party gave her a double share of the treasure, so mm -hmm. that that seemed fair to her. That was better than she was going to get otherwise. So they eventually convinced her to join their caravan, and she became just sort of this figure, and she was on the caravan, and nobody mm -hmm. knew whether she was going to betray them or not, but she was just chaotic evil, incredibly selfish and self-centered in her views, and generally worshipping Pazuzu at all times, despite people's efforts to convert her to other deities. Mm -hmm. um, so another important point, and I don't want to go deeply into this because I mentioned it in the last time, but our five PCs, until we picked up the sixth one in Tian Sha, were Linda's character, Bryn, who mm -hmm. was a um, psychopomp planner scion, but an, an earlier one before the Dustborn um, that I had created for a third party. Yeah, the Dustwalker. The Dustwalker, Dustwalker, yeah. yeah, that I had created for a third party. Linda made Dustwalker, so it all went full circle. Yes. Um, but um, named Bryn Hemlock, who was adopted by Sheriff Hemlock after her father was the last victim of Chopper, and she was meant to be the final sacrifice to Pazuzu. Mm -hmm. This gets important very soon, because oh. we had the Ninja Kagi, <laughs> whose grandfather was the skeleton. We also had the Deaf and Burned Hands Oracle of Life Thysop, as well as the Self Daughter of Tornak from Part 3, but she didn't know that until we got to Part 3, Lissy, and we had Marco Visky, who is related to, is a cousin of Sandru mm -hmm. Visky. That was definitely interesting having Zobi in there with my character particularly hating Pazuzu, and we also had a Lurakian in the, in the party yeah, too. Spivey! So Cat hated yeah. Zobi. The Spivey the Lorakin is also in part one. She's in the graveyard and she joins the party if they convince her to join the caravan. And she's one of the three uh, characters that I have. I have created a Legendary Games product that is very well suited for to do her relationship. The Lonely Lorakian Ultimate Relationships number one. I was going to put out all the relationships that were associated with my run of the J Region campaign. However, um, it turned out that they were super popular and excited. Uh, people got really excited about them among like a tiny subgroup of people, but most people just wanted to make their own relationships, so they didn't buy the product. So there are only three. A lot of them actually are associated with this section because Kelda Oxgutter, who is also found in Brinewall in the prison, um, is a very good fit for the Viking Shield Maiden who lost her other people on a failed run in, at a dungeon. And um, that's two of the three that are out there right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Zyobi being, being Pazuzu-esque and Bryn being known to be someone that Pazuzu wanted to sacrifice mm -hmm. um, led to a lot of back and forth. And Spivey was always saying, why don't we get rid of Zyobi? She worships Pazuzu. And then Zyobi was and then Zyobi was just using it as an example of one of her many screeds about like how good is just hypocritical murderers and they're constantly going murdering harpies for no reason and they're no better than evil. Evil is actually the honest ones who who admit that they're going after things that they want and she just Palis paladins are just genocidal murderers, especially if they worship Torag. Yep. Pazuzu is less evil than Torag. Um, she had a lot of things that she said, and throughout the campaign, people tried to convince her, like, maybe Callistria, you like getting revenge on your ex-lover, or things like that, and they, they sort of made some progress, but then there was a thing that happened in part three that definitely caused Bryn to lose the moral high ground yeah. with, with Zyobi, and we'll, then... We'll get to that. Yeah, and then she kind of stopped. That was stopped. not Bryn's proudest moment. So, based on the fact that Bryn was the special Pazuzu sacrifice... Um, if you remember, there's a cursed Pazuzu statue in part one that Ninda Zago, the weird fiendish decapus, has on his person that gives him a big benefit and gives you, if you're holding it, horrible nightmares and a terrible movement speed. 
So I decided that since Pazuzu was connected to Linda's character and wanted to sacrifice her, that in fact when she held it, she gained the benefits and did not get the movement speed drawback, but did get the horrible nightmares as Pazuzu's mind was in contact with her. Mm -hmm. And um, so she wound up with the Pazuzu statue that actually gave her character, who had very little use for charisma, a giant charisma boost. Mm -hmm. um, this becomes relevant later on. So other than that, I think that I didn't make any major changes to the Prime Wall legacy. I ran that dungeon pretty much as is. Zyobi totally joined the party. And since she is found in a library with books, she just was the harpy who really loves books and Pazuzu and money. Yeah. And herself. And she always was talking about how great she was, but the party would bring her along on adventures sometimes. Eventually, near the end, the Onis tried to contact her to betray the party, and she wound up telling the party about it, and they turned the tables on the Onis because she figured that the Onis might not be trustworthy in offering her stuff, and they made her a daimyo. She got a region. The chaotic mm -hmm. evil harpy got a region of Minkai that she was in control of. We proved to her that she could trust us. Yep. Give her a word. Yep, yep, you mm -hmm. could. And now there's an evil harpy who is a daimyo of uh, Minkai. Mm -hmm. So, um, moving on from part one into part two. In in the early part, I was just we were sort of getting the people together. Um, a lot of it I ran as is. It was, it was just a very strong beginning to the adventure path. Um, but I started adding in more elements to some of the later sections, especially part three when we get there. So part mm -hmm. two, which is, um, let's see, is that Night of the, uh, Night of Hungry Shadows, something like that. Something like that. Um, it's the one where you go to Kalsgard in the land of the Linear Kings, and you have some fun there while being attacked by ninjas that are horrible and try to poison and kill you. And then eventually you defeat the ninjas. So that's the, the overall arc. This time, unlike the first time, I added a bunch of different events that the party encountered on the way up to the Land of the Linarm Kings. I had the Land of the Linarm Kings book, so they went into all the different settlements that were along the way, including one that I told you guys about last time, where there was a murder mystery that was never solved, but the party wound up picking out before she could be burned as a possible witch or the culprit, a Holdra masquerade reveler named Aizala, who was in disguise as a human and who was the murderer by accident because she thought killing an old uh, person who was in horrible pain would bring them back because it's like the first world, right? It's not like the first world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that was an oops. Yeah. And she's a Holdra, so she loves chicken, but she decided to become a vegetarian when she realized that everything dies when you kill it in mm -hmm. uh, the material plane. It was a, an interesting character who joined the caravan at, at that point along the way, and they had some other stops with some weird situations, and they were slightly considering going to that weird Desna place that's in the center of Grugnir Forest, except for that it's it's hella dangerous, so they didn't yeah. do that. And when you say the Light of the Linarm Kings book, you're referring to the campaign setting. Book. Yes. Yeah. Well, is there another Light of the Linarm Kings book? Well, just to be clear. Pathfinder campaign setting. Land of the Linarm Kings. On sale anywhere that still has very old products. <laughs> or in PDF on Paizo.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, you know, it may, just, it may just not potentially be clear what you're talking about. So that, That's fair, that's fair. Mm -hmm. So once they got to Kalsgard, basically people can, um, in the adventure, the PCs can do what they want, but there's this track of them being noticed by the ninjas that causes more and more things to happen to them as time goes along. And then eventually they're able to chase them down to their base and... My group, pretty much, that worked out for us, and I just kept increasing their, um, going through the encounters that were in there. One thing that was very important is, if you remember my Divinations, um, episode that was very early on, maybe the second episode, very important that Detect Poison 
it does not work well in alcohol because the, mm -hmm. the ninjas were supposed to poison the party constantly and they always put it in the alcohol. Um, so that was, that was very useful. That was one of the earlier instances of if an NPC in any of Mark's games offers you alcohol, do not drink it. Ever. Well, I, or tea, I'm running AP. Or like anything. I'm running APs, Linda. That's in the AP. I'm just running War for the Crown and Jade Regent. Yeah. I've offered you alcohol in home games, and it's almost never been poisoned. But maybe it, it's maybe it, maybe it's just the AP. Pass, fair enough. Everything you drink is poisoned. Yeah, just don't drink things that people offer you in Adventure Paths. You're, it's probably poison. Just fill up your own cup from a sealed yes. bottle and then hold on to it because they're trying to poison you. Even if they seem friendly, they're actually trying to poison you. It's definitely true. Mm -hmm. It's definitely true. So, let's see. In, in that one, also, there was a time when, like, ninja assassin archers tried to assassinate one of the party members with like bane arrows and that was the time when they got very frustrated because they decided to assassinate linda mm -hmm. with a bane against human arrow and she was not human because she was a planar scion and they did not know that mm -hmm. so they were a little bit flummoxed i also didn't know that I, my, my character brain also didn't know she wasn't human at that stage so she couldn't have helped you there it's like you're not even human and then the party went on to go to the base of the Hungry Shadows and try to take them on. Oh, let's see here. It says, <laughs> King of Rock says, Lol, I had a war priest that constantly used purified food and drink. That's a smart plan. That works, but now you don't have any alcohol because it's poison. Um, the propaganda said, I've offered you alcohol in home games. It was almost never poison. Yes, yep. that's true. Almost never. Mm-hmm. It's usually not. I mean, other than the, the the poison of the alcohol itself, but people want that poison, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. I don't. I wouldn't count that. Yeah. You know what though? I've never had done a drinking contest that does con damage like that. One of the two different ones that was in Skull and Shackles. Yep. So, you know what? That was more dangerous than the poisons those ninjas put. Yeah, into that, your... that drinking contest rules is just like everybody's gonna die. They actually, <laughs> it's like whoa, like this is really hard. I don't to think work. everyone will die, but you'll at least lose like ten to twenty percent of your crew every time you did a drinking contest using those. Yeah, rules. it was, I it think was that's really morbid, good. so I ended up changing those. Rules, but yeah. <laughs> well, every drinking contest in Pathfinder First Edition had different rules than every other drinking contest. It's like drinking contests and also like times that things catch on fire and how you put how you put out the fire. Uh, King of Rock says rum rations were rum. Yes. Exactly, that's what we're talking Lita about. Lita Scree says rations. that sounds bad for most crews. You don't even know, especially since that was a crew that was really, the captain was really worried about losing crew. And even though he was evil, he had a rule that you don't kill other crew members because we are really light on crew. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know what the situation is, but we are talking about Skull and Shackles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we can, because the, the two of us have been in a lot of different adventure paths, or running, or playing. But Jade Regent is one where I really added a lot of expansions, and that's the one um, we're mostly talking about here. But we can always move on to different things and move back. So, one of the things that happened in the base of the, of the Hungry Shadows is that I made some adjustments to... Two of the characters. I changed Goatee Runecaster to be more opportunistic, chaotic, neutral, half troll, half spriggan, first worldy, weird um, sorcerer guy. And he eventually, like, surrendered and ran away from the party. Uh, only to have some interesting things happen when I ran Legendary Games Baleful Coven, which mm -hmm. I did run next, so I'll get into that. But also, I had him be, like, really curious and interested since he's, his mother was, like, a not winter witch, but witch from Erisan normally. And I changed it to a winter witch, and he was just fascinated by, like, the fey magic and the winter witch magic. He was experimenting on the, uh, the winter wolf who was in there, was normally just a captive winter wolf that was in there, and had changed in uh, the Winter Wolf into human form and locked the Winter Wolf into human form. Locked her because I had changed, as I said in the last adventure, the gender. Since everyone in the adventure path but one um, were PCs who were interested in women, so I introduced 
all of the new characters I introduced were female, and mm -hmm. I kept all the male characters in the adventure path mostly. But this was a sort of new character. Yeah. So, um, that was that was an interesting new character. It was a totally neutral evil winter wolf, but to represent the beating card, uh, had identity dysphoria in a human form, and people didn't realize the character was a winter wolf for much of the adventure, but yeah. the, because of a winter wolf cloak that I had borrowed from Reign of Winter, the winter wolf thought Linda's character was a winter wolf, mm -hmm. and that Winter's, Linda's character knew what was going on, and it was a it was an interesting situation where this character was evil but also was having tro trouble with her own identity was joining this caravan and trying to figure out what her place was yeah now. she thought i was a winter wolf my character Brynn was a winter wolf Brynn thought she was a human it was just this whole confusing mess yep so that was that was definitely interesting and it was a it was an interesting addition of a character so after the party took down this group, and I just realized we actually did have a, a character that joined the party like very temporarily and then left the party who was a Oni spawn um, tiefling who was a member of the Frozen Shadows who left the organization and um, he was there and he helped lead them to some of the places and then the player wound up leaving soon mm -hmm. after that. But there was, and there was another PC during that time. So after that, I ran the Baleful Coven from Legendary Games. Well, sort of. But I mostly ran the Baleful Coven from Legendary Games. This is a add-on adventure where basically three witches that are mad at the PCs or have been convinced to be mad at the PCs team up to send the PCs into a weird other realm that they created. One of them is Gauti Runecaster's mother who is mad that they killed her son. Oops, they didn't kill Gauti Runecaster. Fortunately, one of them is Masami, the witch who is a, um, a white-haired witch type witch from the, um, the Oni from the Five Storms. And so I had her just lie to go to Runecaster's mother and say mm -hmm. that they killed her son. And then there's this other sort of random hag who they just, uh, those two other witches were like, hey, join our coven, it's really cool. So... These all create a, um, a de weird demiplane and trap the PCs in there. So I mostly ran that uh, straight, but I actually... This is where I started using mythic rules more. And my PCs were ridiculously strong. Mm -hmm. So I decided that within their realm that they had created, all three of these witches were mythic. And so they had some weird abilities of... Like, the, the hag was able to just make, like, multiple copies of herself that were around in different places. And Masami actually, um, to fit a trope that later there was sort of um, some monsters in, I think, Best Fairy 5 that were like this. But she became, like, the, her hair was the actual character. And the body was just sort of a doll that she could move around and you could damage and it didn't hurt her. Mm -hmm. Any amount of damage you dealt to the body... It didn't matter, and she regenerated it. And eventually, someone decided to attack the hair. And that, that's when they realized, oh, yeah, the hair is the actual witch. That was a very confusing fight. Yeah. Um, and then they killed um, the Winter Witch in her crazy ice place with some mythic wintery powers. And I believe that that was the point where the first character died in the adventure path because Thysop mm -hmm. the Oracle was killed by the Winter Witch, mother of Goatee Runecaster, in the ice. I think he fell under the water and died. Yeah. And so the Amatatsu seal, which anytime you open the Amatatsu seal, so Nemesis the Barber, says Statler, that, that yes. would be Asami's <laughs> greatest nightmare there. So anytime you open the seal, suddenly all the Oni know what your location is. But they got a big help because of the fact that they were opening it on this quasi demi plane and also there is a sort of issue with Belfold Covenant in that the um the seal can't go into a demi plane or other plane so i just ruled that the weird thing the coven had done with the mythic coven power was not actually send you into a portal to a demi plane but turn the area around it into a demi plane so that that worked with the seal since they happened to be on another plane they lucked out that they opened the seal at a point in time where they were not beaconing mm -hmm. immediately the Oni to their location. That was very helpful to the party. Mm -hmm. But now the great news was 
while they had not killed Gutty Roomcaster, they definitely did kill his mom. So, as I mentioned last time, he, like, gathered up a band of trolls and was chasing after them for the rest of the adventure path. I had plans that he might eventually catch up to them, but the PCs were traveling very quickly to try to avoid the Oni and using a lot of tricks to go faster, and he just couldn't catch up to them reasonably. So they they had they were using the evil Shinobi Fu Hansen from Part 5 that I buffed it up to have their ninja, like, far sight uh, to find Goti Runecaster, and he was always getting closer and closer, and I think he did cross over into the Forest of Spirits, by the end of the campaign. He was very close, but he never actually made it there before they won. Uh, but he was chasing after them Poor just all the time pastor. because they killed his mom after they were supposedly a truce. Um, then again, they didn't know that it was his mom. No, we didn't. It's like, why is there a grave here that's to go to Runecaster? This is bizarre. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah, it was yep. weird. Um, it was very, very interesting. So then we move into part three. Part 3 is one of the parts where I really started adding a lot. So, the, th the thing about Part 3 is the number of miles that the PCs are traveling is enormously high. They're going across the... circumnavigating the globe, going across the crown of the world. Mm -hmm. So, there's already some adventures and the basic Part 3 plot about um, the Hungry Storm. But there's not really much interaction with the Erutaki other than in the one um, small village that you go to. And the party, the Path of Agenhe does travel pretty close to the Erutaki, uh, biggest Erutaki settlement of Aminiut. So um, basically, I added in the party going to Aminiut as a sidetrack uh, when they decided that they were willing to take the risk that the Oni might be waiting for them and spying at Aminiut. And... Ulf Gormander, their guide in the adventure path, basically led them through, and they did a little bit of a variation on the path of Agenhe just to try to, to get rid of pursuit. But as I mentioned last time, I added a whole bunch of different encounters to this area. So basically, what I did was I, once again, because the Herald cards are fun and because they now have a character associated with each of them. I created some more encounters and assigned them to each of the cards. Then I shuffled the deck and I moved some of the cards because some of the encounters had a requirement of where they appeared. Because So the party has to go through the outer ring, onto the high ice, into the boreal expanse, which is super, super cold and dangerous, mm -hmm. down into the high ice again, down into the outer ring again, and then out. So I shuffled the cards and put the encounters into first outer ring, first high ice, Boreal Expanse, second outer ring, oh, uh, oh, sorry, second high eyes, second outer ring. Yeah. And therefore, um, and I took all the encounters that were in the book and put and mapped them to one of these. So, for instance, um, in the Paladin card, a mighty demon of Sithu threatens a small village that's in the way of the monoliths that Kalyan has been building. The PCs can attack the demon and become heroes. That one wound up getting paired up with the marriage, which, as I mentioned last time, caused some interesting interactions. So for the keep, I added a side quest where um, the keep was also the card of Suishin, the, the sword. So where a non-magical scabbard that, that Suishin has an sentimental attachment to, because that was like the scabbard that was part of, uh, that, that Suishin had been in before, had been stolen when Sutoku Amatatsu was heading down that way the the first time, and Suishin was wondering if the party could try to find it, and they did. They wanted to help out. Um, for the Big Sky, I added an encounter that had to be near the end of the Outer Ring called Cold Feet, where Ameko was having second thoughts about being the Empress and vanishes from the caravan. For the Forge, I used Cold Gate from the Hungry Storm. For the Bear, Horned Herd from the Hungry Storm. For the Uprising, uh, an event called Tale of the, Tales of the Resolved, and, um, where nameless NPCs tell their tales to the PCs who understand Minkayan, because they had picked up some Minkayans who had fled and were in the sort of... They had a Minkai town that's like a Chinatown that's in Kalsgard, that's that's just canonically in Kalsgard, because mm -hmm. the other side of the path of Agenhe. And they picked up some of those people who, when Ameko gave a giant speech at the end of Part 2... The party decided to risk giving the giant speech to try to build up their uprising. And that's where they picked up uh, the cook Taihatsu, who was a famous cook 
Mm -hmm. And um, because of the fact that he kept making will saves against, like, random will save events that the PCs failed against, because he would always roll 20 or 19, he was previously known as, like, Minkayan Cook number, number three, three or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And then we decided to give him a real name because he would roll natural 20 or 19 on every time that the whole caravan got hit by something. So yeah. he was clearly secretly a badass, and uh, that is that's what happened with him. Um, so The Fiend was the hunting party event from The Hungry Storm. The Beating was Hungry Predators from The Hungry Storm. But it had an, uh, an event for Arya, which was the new name of Skigny the uh, Winter Wolf, where basically there was an encounter with two Winter Wolves, and they try to get um, see if Arya wants to join the Winter Wolf pack instead mm -hmm. of stay with the party. But the party decided to uh, convince her to stay along with them. For the Cyclone, I did the Black Monolith for the Hungry Storm because, as I mentioned last time, the Cyclone is Katiana's card. Also, any Katiana-based events were based on the Cyclone. The Dance, I added a strange area of wondrous rifts, explosions, and shifts in the ice that yielded a chase-like challenge for the caravan to move through. Some Asrai, which are like Icy Fae, congratulated them and granted good luck. And it turned out that the way the cards went, that that led directly into an Ice Nymph who was in one of the later encounters, which... I know that the random cards did that, suggest pairing them together if you want to run these encounters because it worked out pretty well. Um, also, as I mentioned last time, Bevelik and Vancor Dalmuvian, the random slightly named in the Player's Guide NPCs who were caravan drivers and who I made be super competitive and think caravan driving is serious business, were very excited about this. They were like, see, this is a contest of the most important skill for an adventurer, driving a wagon. And some of the, and some of the PCs were like, why are we doing this? This seems unnecessarily dangerous. But it's like caravan driving! Yes! Serious business! Alright, so for the cricket, I had Sandru, since he was the cricket, notice signs of a rare sky metal deposit and ask if the group wants to stay put and dig it out. But there were dark tapestry creatures in the mini dungeon. And uh, the group did some interesting things with that. I think that I actually wound up rolling that for being in... The in Nameless the, Spires the themselves. Nameless spires themselves. The Nameless yeah, Spires right. are a ruin in the very North Pole that is not actually in the Adventure Path, although you go right by it. But um, there is, once again, a Legendary Games adventure where you go there. And so, Sandu found the Sky Metal while the party was resting and, and recovering and, and doing things in the Nameless Spires. And... That mini dungeon also had, I, I think I added a like a, a, a lesser star spawn of Cthulhu, but you guys were yeah. ridiculously overpowered, so you won anyway. Um, that was not a safe place to, to adventure. But you got Sky Metal. We did. We did. It was worth it. It was a very valuable caravan good. All right. So for the juggler, which was that new character Esmeralda that I mentioned last time, uh, who was the arcane trickster. She gets bored and goes off on her own to explore. She returns to the caravan one day four days later if left to her own devices with a treasure. So so, so with these two combined, Mako and Esmeralda both vanish from the caravan at some point and have the PCs being like, what happened? And then, of course, of course, did Zyobi kill them comes up because yep. we never really fully trusted Zyobi. Did Zyobi eat said, them? Did Zyobi, that's right. Did Zyobi eat them? Um, Speaking of which, Zyobi actually had a really good relationship with Thysop, the... Um, the because he was a deaf oracle and she was a mute oracle yeah and they really got along and to the point where uh she really wanted to kind of eat the pcs sort of but not really but sort of yes mm -hmm. and so when thysop died and they resurrected him with the tattoo seal but they still had his frozen body yeah he let uh, he agreed to let zobi eat the original body and the rest of the pcs were just like what the actual heck just happened and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, that, this is fine. I don't need it anymore. So in my relationship, this is their, their gifts. So that was considered a gift. And so she felt much closer to him having eaten him um, <laughs> at that point. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that was the thing that happened in the adventure. Yep. Um, I think Esmeralda also took Koya with her um, because Esmeralda was another one of Koya's foster kids because mm -hmm. Koya had a lot of foster kids. And they had some interesting situations um, going, oh, wait, no, As, it, this happened during the time when everyone was split into pieces, and she oh, took one of the right. Koyas with her, which was Koyas. actually dangerous, Yeah. but uh, I'll get into that later on. 
So the locksmith card, an Arataki grandmother res recognized Whispering Shrike, which is a weapon that is taken off of, I think, Omoyani, the ninja from part two, that Kagi, who was the locksmith card, each PC had a card as well. Uh, Kagi, the ninja PC, had grabbed that weapon. And she recognized that as a weapon of a man named Sutamu who helped them when she was a little girl. And she asked Kagi for help on uh, a quest. The Peacock. Uh, so for the Peacock, I basically put the Mark of Tornak, which was sort of signs of the wizard Tornak's exploration up near the, the North Pole. Um, he is the father of one of my PCs, Lisi, but also canonically the father of the, he was kind of raped by a succubus, and their child was Kadiana, the BBEG of Part 3. Meaning that Kadiana is the half-sister of one of the PCs. Mm -hmm. Super relevant to the adventure. Uh, so, the Rabbit Prince card, which is the card I had for Kelda. Erutaki tells of a great beast in the local region inspired Kelda to request the caravan go out of its way to specifically hunt the beast. And the party completely did that. It was basically, I think, a giant boule and... They took that thing down. That was one of the that was one of the side quests where it, where it was sort of like, wait a minute, are we doing the rain main mission main mission or are we doing all these side quests? Yes, caravan ice racing. Yes, go hunt the beast. At certain uh, what was it like? Our guide Wolf Gormander is like every time we yes. went off the path, he's like, no. Wolf Gormander kept saying that we needed to stay on the path, and the PCs who did who voted not to do the side quest always gained camaraderie points with Ulf. Yes. Ulf was like, yes, thank you. Let's stay on the path, please. <laughs> and everyone else was like, no! And then Kelda, get, they gained camaraderie points with Kelda when they wanted to do Kelda's quest. Camaraderie points are something you gain to go in between ranks in my relationship subsystem. Mm -hmm. They're not the same as the relationship points in the ultimate campaign relationship system. Um, so, yeah, that, that definitely happened. Ulf, yeah. Ulf was a very nice straight man to these side quests where he was just like, why are we doing this? This is already going to be dangerous. We're getting close to winter when you can't even cross. Uh, and we're like, adventure! Over there! So the avalanche was the card for the five storms themselves. So that was an agent of the five storms who arrives to stir up trouble. They have a little bit about that in the adventure. Plus, my PCs did keep opening the um, the seal when people died. And mm -hmm. so that Relate, was Related point. to us going off in every possible side tangent that was dead <laughs> <dangling laughs> near us. <laughs> So, the Crows was the Death from Below encounter from the Hungry Storm. Demon's Lantern was the Northern Lights encounter from the Hungry Storm. Um, the Trumpet was Wings of Hope from the Hungry Storm. Survivor, I had a survivor from a deadly avalanche who needed the PCs help to escape from a cave-in and return to his people. He offered a magic item in exchange for his rescue. In the Desert, which is Shalalu's card, Shalalu noticed some dangerous ice flows in the region and requested the caravan halt while small teams map the ice flows. Brass Dwarf, which was Bevelok and Vancor, the caravan drivers, was rough terrain from the Hungry Storm, except the two brothers each have proposals for how to deal with the rough terrain. And, um, like, I think one of them wanted to, like, modify the caravan, um, route, and also maybe, like, build some things on the wagon to go a different mm -hmm. way. And one of them was like, well, just go through the dangerous area real fast. That was before we got the hover wagon, right? Yeah, they did not, you did not have the hover wagon yet. So the hover wagon was a special um, modified mag wagon that I, I let the PCs build using some of the clockwork tech that they found in the Nameless Spires. And I added it to the list of possible wagons. And it was just the hover wagon. It became their, like, flagship wagon. Yeah. Um, so the Brass Dwarf was that. The Teamster was a rural flight from the Hungry Storm. Mountain Man, which is Ulf Gormander's card in my card system, was the Wanderers from the Hungry Storm. But there's an Ulf event. Ulf knows one of the Wanderers, who was an ex of his from his many times crossing this area, who demands Ulf and a second fight her and her sister in 2 verse 2. Now, if I remember correctly in this, we had uh, we had one of the NPC Kelda fight, but then we buffed her to the gills, so it just, like, totally wasn't a fair combat. People wanted to get Kelda to light the boar by saying Kelda was the strongest. Yeah. Uh, then Entangled Briar was the crevice from the Hungry Storm. Sickness was Creeping Rot from the Hungry Storm. The Waxworks was Wagon Damage from the Hungry Storm. The Waxworks hold you in place. Mm -hmm. Hidden Truth was the re a wrecked caravan from the Hungry Storm. Uh, the Wanderer was the cabin from the Hungry Storm. But 
I had a Helgerval event there. If you remember Helgerval being the helmet Cassisian who just like sort of decides to go in the adventure path, go undercover on a ship. I guess I didn't mention him in part two, but mm -hmm. he decides to go undercover on a ship and to try to figure things out. That is a ship that's about to get burned. He goes undercover as a helmet. I decided that that meant he was actually a detective bard and created the Cassisian detective who is a very different version of Helgerval type character that is in Ultimate Relationships number three by Legendary Games who because he works for Black Butterfly and is is interested in like lacunae between thoughts because he has perfect memory but he's also has a chase crush on Zoles or Verity because he loves detectives and he wanted to figure out what happened in this mysterious cavern and so they cabin and they had a mystery in the cabin um uh, so the joke, uh, Spivey decides to liven up the journey by playing a few pranks and leaving evidence to frame other people as guilty parties. That was kind of fun. The Inquisitor was another interesting event. A strange plague erupts that begins to force the caravan members to tell the truth. It feeds on magic, including magic that attempts to remove it. A rare herb from the region can be used to synthesize a cure. Yeah, so when this came up, we decided that there were, like a lot of the players decided there weren't enough things where... To, to interpret this as not just tell the truth, but you also have to talk about what you're thinking. So there was a lot of, like, really blunt, like, well, that was dumb, and things like that. And we were just, like, laughing at the kinds of things that the PCs were saying to each other. Taking it sort of as a, as a chance to reveal their, their inner thoughts. I think if someone asked you a question, you also couldn't not answer Yeah, it. I think that was part of it, too. Yep. So we were definitely asking each other pointed questions to try to figure things out. Mm-hmm. That was a fun session. So the foreign trader... Um, which was the card of Thysop, the oracle, since the foreign trader asked for something weird and in exchange gives you something special. He is an oracle who had a curse mm -hmm. and had power. He is deaf, but he began to hear strange music from the distance. As he heads off after it, it grows louder. If he turns to tell the others, it grows quieter and silences if others come with him. If he follows it to its source, he discovers a strange harp buried in the ice that only he can hear when it's played. So, I'm... Um, the player of, of Thysop is a pretty conservative player in terms of going off riskily with his mm -hmm. um, healing and support based characters, so I think they never got the harp. No, we didn't. But get it. Um, that was just a weird event that happened. I mean, we are there's already two other events of like NPCs wandering off on the road and everyone freaking out. So like, it's good that our healer didn't decide to do that because we could have been in real trouble if like something then came and attacked us. That's true. So the vision was ice hunters from the hungry storm. And Goti Runecaster was also joining up with some ice trolls, but fortunately for the party, they just outpaced him. So they just had regular ice hunters. But Goti Runecaster's card being the vision, it sort of made sense. Rakshasa was a frozen dead from the Hungry Storm. Uh, the Idiot was the Polar Mirage from the Hungry Storm, only in the Boreal Expanse. Mm -hmm. Snakebite was Black Slush from the Hungry Storm, only in the Boreal Expanse. Some of these just had requirements like. The regular travelers obviously couldn't be in the Boreal Expanse. Yeah. And I, di I guess I didn't say. Some of these were outer ring only, like Eritaki encampments. Uh, we'll get to that. Winged Serpent was the caravan encounters opponents who are at a disadvantage, able to strike with a great ambush. I think that was the very first thing that you guys encountered, and you just completely clobbered yeah. them. Um, a midwife, uh, which was Koya's card, had Aurora from the Hungry Storm, with a Koya event to watch the Aurora and stars at night with Koya. Then... As the party moved through the Alabastrian Peaks, Koya wanted to take a look at them. She loves exploring and seeing new mm -hmm. things. And also there was a Koya Helgerval event um, that I can't remember what it was, but it says that it's in here in my notes. Um, so the Publican was an Erutaki encampment event from the Hungry Storm. The Queen Mother was an event where an eating medic snowcaster elf attempts to hide from the party. He knows a fair deal about what is happening in the Crown, but it won't be easy to convince him to part with that information. And he actually is who clued the PCs into the herbs they needed to cure the um, oh, yeah, that was the, truth, the truth problem that they I, had. I, I think like, out of character, some of us were kind of wishing that it would last longer because it was just funny, but, you know. <laughs> the owl, which was Linda's character's card, mm -hmm. is at a crossroads rests a lost soul. Even with spirit empathy, the soul won't pass on. It does lead bread to a home in an Aritaki encampment to solve a murder. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, Prim was able to solve that. It yeah. eventually was like a Kalupi Luke or something. Yeah, that was the from Kalupi the back Luke. Matter. But yeah, it was uh, it was definitely because my because with uh, 
part of the whole well it was uh, called reaper is the uh the ancestry but um part, part of the whole thing there with her connection to the psychopomps is that she definitely at that point was worshiping phrasma and she very much had a strong desire to put spirits to rest and a blinding hatred for all things undead that surpassed all other concerns eventually she sort of made her own mystery cult that was a syncretic combination of Phrasma, Ashava, and some other stuff. Yeah. Uh, because of the fact that the mystery cultist who was in the party who had her own mystery cult, that sort of idea, which was also syncretic between, um, I think, Arche and, and uh, uh, what's his name? The uh, Limnier. Limnieris, yeah. yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. that just the idea of that sort of appealed to Bryn later on in the adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, so Carnival, um, that was the card for Izala, the Holdra Masquerade Reveler. Signs of strange fey in the area indicate there might be a rift to the first world. They wound up finding a lesser bandersnatch there. It was pretty vicious. Eclipse yeah. was the frozen dead from the hungry storm. The mute hag, an agent provocateur from the five storms, attempts to learn the caravan members' weaknesses and try to exploit them. The lost was where Ziobi realized that maybe Sithud, this demon lord that you're dealing with now, might be cooler than uh, Pazuzu. Although, the party convinced her not to do that. Because Bryn hates undead the most, even mm -hmm. more than Pazuzu. Yep. This will become relevant later on as well. And Sithud is sort of an undead um, demon lord that Katiana worships. The Empty Throne, a small caravan passed in the opposite direction from Minkai with a good number of refugees. If they learn of a Manko's status as heir, they will offer to aid to take down the Jade Regent. Mm -hmm. The Theater, a Manko decides to put on a play about Brinewall to help educate the new caravan members. Uh, that was a funny one. Like, Ziobi yeah. wants to play Ziobi and be the most badass because she did get the final hit on the boss in Brian Wall. Yeah, and... I mean, it was, it was like, well, you know, you have to properly show my glory here. And I was actually the most important and the things like that. And so we're all, like, discussing how did things actually happen and what were, who actually And they had to have, like, I think, like, an extra hold-up cards with Ziobi's lines because of that she was telepathically communicating so that yeah. everyone in the audience would know. Since she was mute and could yes. not actually say that lines. And would not have in the play. Yes. Um, yeah, that was interesting. So in the unicorn, um, Catherine slash Kitty, um, Devrin, who was the mystery cultist and who's carved the unicorn, sees a strange vision upon a twinkling star that seems to have granted her one wish. After deliberating for a long time, she discovers it did not grant her wish at, at, after all, but she was grateful for the chance to consider what matters to her. The marriage... Uh, uh, the Eritaki decide to um, basically offer the, the a son or daughter's hand in marriage to the most heroic looking PC, which I was tied to the paladin fight where they fought a demon, and it was Marco the Rogue. Mm -hmm. Chaotic neutral, shirked all responsibility. I was sure he was going to just find a way out of it, maybe politely, maybe not, but he actually accepted the proposal. As I mentioned last time, we wound up with Kiora the... Undine, but with the trait to look completely human, water singer bard, who joined the campaign at that point. So, the twin, the card of everything's weird and you don't know what's going on, caravan members began shattering into multiple pieces, representing different parts of their personalities. Putting them back together was complicated, but they would eventually die on their own. When I said Esmeralda left with Koya, Esmeralda actually left with, like, the young Koya, who was, like, young spirited and actually looked younger than the other Koyas and wanted to super do adventures that had Koya like had the, never done. Yeah, it had like Koya's adventuresome spirit without her wisdom, so it yes. just ran off with Esmeralda who didn't have high wisdom and then, yeah. Because Esmeralda was always the irresponsible one and Koya was like the mother figure who yeah. was more responsible, but young Koya was basically very similar to Esmeralda mm -hmm. and it was the, the non-wise Koya and then th that was... Once the party figured out how to get people together and convince some of the parts that did not want to join back up, like with the Mako, the Empress of Mako, and the, like, I'm just a tavern owner of Mako, really didn't want to join together. Mm -hmm. uh, but once they figured out they would die, they were like, oh, crap, but one of the Koyas is just not here. And that was the yeah. character who was actually at risk in the end. But uh, they managed to save her, and they learned a lot about different PCs. One of the PCs, uh, Thysop, the... Uh, the Oracle was one of the ones who split off, and but one of his versions did not have his curses, and 
was sort of a shirker who didn't want to go on the adventure. Wom mm -hmm. was just constantly healing everybody. So it was a it was a pretty interesting time um, for the caravan. The courtesan was the party enters the realm of an ice nymph who demands to be entertained. She feels the darkness of Kariana's power rising and will potentially reveal some of what she knows if the PCs amuse her. I, uh, it happened that that went right after the the Fae were amused by the PCs going through the chase, and that worked well for like the realm of this ice nymph. Yeah, it did. And the last three were all from the Hungry Storm. Tyrant was the dragon sighting from Hungry Storm. Betrayal was Polar Pudding from Hungry Storm. And Liar was Lonely Maiden from Hungry Storm. So mostly I just used the Hungry Storm encounters and added some of my own just to make it feel like you really were there for months and months like the PCs were traveling. Plus, mm -hmm. adding the Legendary Games expansion at the High Ice. Uh, or sorry, at the Nameless Spires. Mm -hmm. So I would say one of the biggest things that changed for this party was the fact that you had Lissy, the half-sister of Kadiana. So for those of you who didn't read Jade Regent... Uh, Kadiana is already a half fiend. That might have been enough for um, for the Hungry Storm to just say she's evil because she's a half fiend. But it goes into great detail about the fact that she was broken by an evil demon cult who told her her father and her family hate her, and the only one who will ever love her is Sithu, the demon lord, who she must offer herself up to, and all this other stuff. So I decided that based on that backstory, that she was clearly desperate for affection. So, she basically tried to get... Once she found out that her half-sister, the daughter of Tornak, was here, she was at first kind of jealous that, like, this sister had um, the love of their father. But since he left his, his daughter, Lissy, and went to explore the northern area and was not around growing up because he had been killed by the succubus... Mm -hmm. um, I was very surprised by how much Lissy just sort of let Kadiana badmouth their father and just agreed that he, um, with certain things, or let it at least pass, even though she didn't hate her father. And she actually got along pretty okay with Kadiana to the point where Lissy convinced the party to let Kadiana exterminate the Erutaki by vote. And they barely agreed, because Kadiana agreed to use the storms to screw up the Oni who were chasing the party, and to help the party have an easy passage to Minkai, because Kadiana pointed out that the population of all the Erutaki was way lower than the population of Minkai. There, there, was, there was some deception going on here, let's be real. Well, I think that the party did vote that way, but it was very close. Eventually, there was a concerted effort by Bryn, who hates undead, and Tithud is a demon lord of undead, and Thysop, the life oracle, convinced Marco, the rogue, that his wife, who was Erutaki, would not be happy if her entire <laughs> people were exterminated and to change his vote uh, back over to killing Kadiana. But that was after they had gone to the Nameless Spires for the other adventure. They actually came back, broke their word, and attacked and killed Kadiana, although Lissy refused to join the adventure. And so the adventure path did proceed as planned, in case you were wondering, oh my gosh, what what happened there? I also changed her from a cleric to a shaman who had sky and lore um, stuff, which was very appropriate for her in the encounter. I gave her some extra demons uh, because the PCs had done a lot of encounters in the Nameless Spires and they mm -hmm. leveled up a lot. Speaking of which, Legendary Game has, um, I can't remember the name of the, um, the adventure, but it's in the Nameless Spires. And it added a sort of part clockwork construct ninja named um, Miria, who dies if she's not wound up by another clockwork valet. Uh, my party decided why not take the valet too. Mm -hmm. The adventure assumes if she comes at the party, she just dies. So she wound up being added to the adventure as well as another sort of relationship link character for the peacock, the one about standing still since she had been there for a long time holding this crown that was created as a MacGuffin in the Legendary Games adventure to sort of track down the Oni. So, the party befriended her, did that adventure, and then went back to kill Kadiana. The problem was that without Lissy, mm -hmm. the party, the people that the party brought to kill Kadiana were just not quite up to the task. It was close. It was close. But they were probably going to TPK in the encounter. They might have won. Mm -hmm. But... The important thing is that Bryn was sure that they were going to TPK. Yes. Because, and then that we were all going to become undead. And that you were, they were going to be turned into undead. And yes. The reason she was sure of this is that 
Remember that statue of Pazuzu? Well, the Pazuzu, uh, it allowed Pazuzu to telepathically communicate with Bren. And he was pointing out that, uh, that she would turn you all into undead and that they were going to lose. And it was like, all you have to do is say my name three times in one breath and I'll take care of this for you. Because Pazuzu really wanted to gain the power of the Moroscos and the storms that... I mean, Kariana was giving this storm and sky power to this pissant minor, lesser demon lord, Sithu. Pazuzu is the lord of all the abyssal skies. He wanted to take control of the power for himself. Mm -hmm. And Bryn totally did say... His name three times. His name three times and got possessed by Pazuzu, who then just wrecked house with Kariana... And destroyed her completely. That was not a smart decision. And Kadiana was like, what? After all this, you betrayed me because you didn't want to deal with the demon lord, and now you're dealing with the demon lord? I just don't understand <laughs> how treacherous you people are. Um, so she got possessed by Pazuzu. Mm -hmm. uh, Kadiana's ghost wound up dispel eviling the Pazuzu brain after a, a very high initiative combined with a very high caster level check. That yeah, I thought, I, I, thought I was sacrificing my character at that point. Yeah, I but probably was going she to left you to die in the middle of the of the tundra in a place where indoor elements was not sufficient to keep you alive. And you almost did die. I ended up you having to use really high survival and like making campfires with my arrows and all. Sorts Didn't of you like stuff. build I like, built, like burrows yeah. to try to trap the heat? Burrows to try to trap the heat. Yeah. And you were running out of like some kind of consumables you were using to protect yourself. Yeah. And you eventually staggered back to the nameless spires where the party was able to find you again, and we're very surprised, and we're wondering if you were Pazuzu. Yes. Ah, uh, King of Rock says obviously Pazuzu is his favorite mm -hmm. demon lord. So the best part about that is that no one was actually sure if Bren was just Pazuzu being really good at bluff because and disguise because Bren because Pazuzu is very good at bluff and disguise. And also the chances that I actually survived all of what, that. What, why would she survive if she wasn't Pazuzu? So Zyobi just kept calling Bren Lord Pazuzu after Bren that point. Bren did not like that. And being like, Lord Pazuzu, what is thy bidding? And then even at the point where everyone, including Zyobi, was pretty sure it wasn't Pazuzu, Zobi still kept calling Bryn Lord Pazuzu because Bryn had been like, you shouldn't worship Pazuzu. Don't deal with Pazuzu. He's bad. <laughs> um, and then Bryn was like, yeah, you know what? I'm a massive hypocrite. I, and then she would, I, was dumb, Zobi but... would be like, Lord Pazuzu, don't you think it's funny that Bryn, who kept trying to convince me not to work with Pazuzu, was the one who was who is your now your avatar, Lord Pazuzu? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bryn totally deserved 100% of that. That was hilarious. At that point, also, Thysop decided he should stop trying to convert Zyobi into a different religion because the party had shown that, really, they didn't have any place to stand on after Bryn accepted Pazuzu in order to defeat Kariana. Yep. So that was fun. And they did build a hover wagon, mm -hmm. which was probably more fun for them, but it was very amusing when uh, Bryn was possessed by Pazuzu. Yep. And they eventually made it to that, that necropolis at the end with all the yetis in it, where they did defeat Kariana again, and they sort of bound her within one of the twigs from that weird spirit tree that is in the dungeon, and then plane shifted that to the um, boneyard. With like with, a giant note that described with, like With a giant a letter for the psychopomp. This yeah. is a dangerous ghost in here. She has unfinished business that she has not completed but we're sending her to the boneyard. Please <laughs> deal with this. Um, meanwhile also there's one yeti that's always described as like liking to watch the random tree and the party decided to convince that yeti to join them and he became a leshy warden druid named Norkyut who loved trees and had a tiny little leshy that was always riding on the yeti who joined the group as the bear. So cute. Also, by the way, at this point, Lissy was just not very happy. So there was there were some spells that she wanted to add to the to her druid list, and we were playing with sort of a commonality rule where if it's not in some of the core books, you can still add them to a cleric or a druid, but they don't just like Paizo Puzzle the Book, Bleh, a bunch of spells exist. Mm -hmm. So there were some that Linda's character had it that because she was also a druid, that Lissy, who was a, a uh, Mystic Third uh, Sky Druid, wanted to add on. So she, she asked for a scroll that had several spells that were legitimate, and then one, Call Spirit, that 
absolutely there was no reason for Lissy to add because it was not on her list. Oh, Linda only had it from an archetype. Mm -hmm. But so the player just asked Linda, can you help me craft this? Because the player had Scribe Scroll. It's like, can you work with me to Scribe Scroll and provide the spells for the following five spells? And one of them was Call Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so Linda agreed. And no, I did not know, like, out of character. Like, only this player and Mark knew what she was up to. And uh, King of Rock also does that with the extra spells. So I knew about this. So she had Call Spirit. She didn't really care about the other four spells. She did have a scroll of them now. Mm -hmm. But she used Call Spirit to call up Katiana's spirit and make a bargain with Katiana. And basically, the she agreed to bring Katiana back from the dead... Uh, as long as Katiana did not, like, take revenge on the party and prevent them from doing stuff with Minkai. And, um, Katiana agreed to, in fact, help the party, uh, because Lissy wanted some other things, but they, their compromise they reached in the end was that Katiana would actually stay with the party so Lissy could watch her and help them take on Minkai. Then mm -hmm. afterwards, she would go back and exterminate the Arutaki. And, um, Lissy agreed, and Katiana said she was so touched by the fact that her sister's love was so strong that she could put her uh, prejudice aside against the fact that her sister wanted to exterminate the Arutaki, even though she was a Desna worshipping character and was willing to accept her for who she was. And so Lissy, meanwhile, was thinking maybe if she stays with the party for long enough, she will realize mm -hmm. that people care about her and not want to exterminate the Arutaki for Sithud. But also she, she said she promised she wasn't going to stop her. So... She then wound up saving a lot of money and uh, all of her shares from the treasure. Instead of actually um, basically buying magic items, she resurrected Katiana, who then disguised herself with her high charisma from being half succubus as like this random person that they found in Minkai. There was a time when the party split up to recruit people from Minkai. Mm -hmm. And they, so Lissy went to this random forest and was like, I found this shaman here. She's a... Uh, Heaven's Lore Shaman from Minkai. Um, and she just was in the party. She was using all the same abilities that Katiana had. And nobody actually questioned or thought it was Katiana. Until nobody in or out of character. Really after the entire on. AP was over, the player decided to tell everyone yeah, well, that, that was Katiana. Yeah, well, none of us thought that she would do that. That she had, like, this whole convoluted plan. And that she had this, like, particular relationship with her sister. Like, we had no idea. Well, fortunately, no one tried to get a social link with that character. Because it would have been the Cyclone, which was Katiana's card. Yeah. But, um... That absolutely occurred, and that sort of takes us po through part three. I also added a lot of stuff to part four, five, and six, but this is um, this is probably a good point for, for this one. Mm -hmm. And if we want to have a Jade Regent part three, that'll probably take me through the end of all the extra rebellion stuff, the spirits and the puzzles in the Forest of Spirits, and some of the tweaks and adjustments to building up support in part five, Tide of Honor. So, um, that being said, I think that now is a good time to say bye to YouTube. So, bye YouTube! See you bye. next time on Tuesday.